genau, ich möchte immersiert sein einfach da drin. Fertig. In einer glaubwürdigen Welt. Mehr nicht. Das möchte ich haben. Das ist so, das ist so wichtig. Hi, ich wurde vom äh, Chat gezwungen, mit vorgehaltener Pistole äh, die Half-Life-Dokumentation zu gucken. Die geht aber eine Stunde. Und ich habe schon vorgewarnt, ich weiß nicht genau, ob ich irgendwas dazu sagen kann. Außer vielleicht, oh, was? Oh, hey, oh, krass, oh, oh boah. Ich hoffe, ich kann da jetzt irgendwas Sinnvolles dazu beitragen. Interessant finde ich es schon. Eigentlich würde ich was privat gucken. Aber jetzt gucken wir es halt zusammen. Mal gucken, was passiert. Oh, hey, oh, boah, oh, krass, oh, was? Well. You just go over the mountains over here and you're in high desert. Uh, you get past Ellensburg and it's, and it's high desert. So I spent a lot of time out there getting, getting a reference. Uh, most of the reference came from Eastern Washington. I did a drive out to the Columbia Gorge and took a lot of photos and also a lot of just reference imagery. And big cliffs and stuff like that. That ja. drive was two days. It was eight hours down, eight hours back, and I and I'm not even sure I spent the night. I did. I must have done. Spent the night down there. So while it was definitely made for the Southwest, the local reference was um, out. Wie cool das da draußen auch aussieht, ne? Äh, Entschuldigung, ich weiß, ich weiß, ne, ist eine half doku aber ich gucke mir gerne Hintergründe an. Und da unten, das sieht ein bisschen aus wie, wie in, als würde hier gleich Life is Strange losgehen. Warte, falls ihr ja, Untertitel, ich weiß, ja, aber lernt er nicht. Columbia Gorge. Bellevue. Good morning and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. Oh, Flashback einfach. das Spiel noch aussieht, ne? Also Half-Life sieht heute so aus, äh, wie glaube ich, wie glaube ich, ähm, gefühlt Tetris vor 20 Jahren ausgesehen hat. Das ist, das ist halt so, so gealtert, dass man jetzt so denkt, oh, das ist eher so Playstation 1, also war natürlich auch ein bisschen, aber das ist Playstation 1 Ära irgendwie so. Das ist so ganz, ganz andere Zeit einfach. Ne, Doom, ich würde, oder? Ach, ich bin unsicher. Sieht Doom noch geiler aus? Ich weiß es nicht genau. Ich kann es nicht, nicht mal beurteilen. Aber ich bin ehrlich, ich fände es voll interessant. Ich weiß, es ist die Half-Life-Doku, aber ich hätte auch gerne eine Valve-Doku. Äh, wie es in der Company so aussieht, wie die arbeiten, wie das mit Steam funktioniert, bla bla bla. Na, so, sowas halt auch mal. So ein Behind-the-Scenes. Fände ich auch super spannend. Mein Name ist Mike Harrington. Ich war uh, Co-Founder at Valve. I wasn't really used to big companies when I started at Microsoft. Hier ist ein Buch, steht drauf Photoshop. Früher hatten Leute Bücher, um mit Software zu arbeiten. Nicht kurz bei Google suchen, nicht YouTube Tutorials. Man hat sich Bücher gekauft, ja, oft auch aus dem Data Becker Verlag oder von Markt und Technik, ja, und dann hat man Bücher zu Photoshop 2.0 gelesen oder sonst oh Gott, das ist einfach und dann waren so schwarz-weiß Bilder, die das erklärt haben. Das ist aber Völlig absurd heute. Oh Gott. Ich hatte ganze Regale voll mit, mit diesen Büchern. Puh. Like a big high school. You know, nine years later it was significantly bigger. I was like, oh, this place is too big. And you know, that was still like 1996. So they had a long ways to go. You know, I told my managers like a year before, like I'm leaving. I'm leaving in a year and I'm going to start a game company. And the first person I talked to was a um, good friend of mine, Michael Abrash. But at that time he was trying to do something within Microsoft. And by the time, you know, it made sense, um, John Carmack had convinced him to go work at id. So how could he say no to that? And then I was having lunch with Gabe and I said, Gabe, you know, I'm leaving. I'm just going to leave and I'm going to start a game company. He goes, I want to leave. I want to start a game company. I go, All right. And that was it. <laughs> you know, on the surface, guy. we should have failed. Like, and, and realistically, both Mike and I thought we would get about a year into it, realize we'd made horrible mistakes and, and go back to our friends at Microsoft. Mich würde interessieren, ob Valve als Company sich heute, also wenn, wenn Steam nie gegeben hätte, wenn ihr nie Steam, ist natürlich müßiger, ne, was wäre wenn, ist immer sinnlos, aber nur aus Neugier würde es mich interessieren, ob es Valve in der Form noch geben würde, wenn sie Steam nie rausgeballert hätten. Wenn Steam nicht dieser riesige Erfolg geworden wäre. Ich frage mich, ob, ob Valve dann irgendwann äh, von von der Embracer Group aufgekauft worden wäre, wie alles andere ja gefühlt auch. Äh, oder von EA oder so. Würde mich wahnsinnig interessieren. Ask for our jobs back. 
Uh, but we did think that we knew a fair bit cool. about software Bart, development, that there were expertise that goes into it. I think we also had some pretty clear ideas of how to design a company, right? So when we were building Half-Life, we were also designing Valve at the same time. We had no plan except for, by then, I, like I mentioned, um, Michael had gone to id, and he said, oh, you're, you're, you're starting a game company, you, you have to use our engine. So Gabe and I flew down to Mesquite to meet it. We spent a good deal of time with you know, John Romero and he told us like, this is what you need to do to start a game company. You need to go out and hire some level designers and you know, do that kind of thing. And we kind of understood the engineering part. And then, you know, because we were Michael's friends, you know, we walked away with the source code to Quake that day. We had no contract yet. We had kind of an idea of what it could be. And they just gave us a CD and we had kind of the crown jewels of it. And, and that's, you know, game. Überleg mal, du gehst einfach zu einer Company ja, oder, oder, oder du bist so auch connected oder befreundet einfach so innerhalb von einer Game-Branche und dann gehst du einfach irgendwo hin. Ähm, das war ja auch ein bisschen bei Kojima so. Äh, Guerilla hat denen ja die Game-Engine gegeben, mit denen sie Horizon gemacht haben. Und dadurch ist dann, die, darauf wurde dann Death Stranding aufgebaut. Einfach, einfach so. Und deswegen hat man auch manchmal Horizon-Elemente bei Death Stranding gesehen. Ähm, und ich bin ehrlich, ich, ich, liebe, ich liebe so eine Crossover. Ich liebe das einfach. Wenn die dann sagen, okay, ja komm, hier ist unser Stoff, wir, wir supporten euch, bla, äh, liebe ich einfach. Nicht, nicht dieses krawatten konkurrenz -Ding, bla bla bla, alles ausbluten, sondern dieses Miteinander. Ich habe da leider eine sehr große Schwäche für. <lacht> I think most of us had no game development experience. We were either amateurs working in our homes at night for fun, or we, some people were from the software world, but they had never worked on a game. I think we had three or four people in the entire company who had actually shipped a game when we started Half-Life. We have to figure out what is Valve's first game. So we have to come up with an IP. So everything is done from scratch. Gabe came into the office and he said, I read this story, I read this Stephen King story called The Mist. You know, Stephen King, it's got monsters, you know, people in a grocery store, fog comes in, <laughs> monsters in the fog, you know, use your imagination. We didn't want to write that as a game. That wasn't really the point, but it was just the tension and, you know, how, how it felt. Well, it was interesting. At first, we had two games. Greg was working oh, Prospero, yeah. and then Half-Life was originally called Quiver. My job was then build a team and figure Inspired out another Stephen game King. for us okay, to build. It'll be the second Hedge game about gedacht. ships. What features should it have? How is it going to be different from a normal first-person shooter? Every time the engine got a feature for Prospero, Half-Life stole it. <lacht> And then Half-Life just started getting visually, you know, more impressive. Alien Logenic Chainsaw. Wie geil das auch gemalt ist einfach. Schlorp, cleans up levels. Sensor spines, creature wraps around body, takes place of arm. Oh, okay. In range, takes out multiple enemies with huge rapid bites. Chomp, grala, grala. <lacht> Oh, ist das schön. Oh, wie cool. And cooler. And eventually it just, yeah, because it was going to ship sooner, it just stole the resources from Prospero and Prospero just faded away. So I had this character had a, a like a floating orb and it had wanted to have some, you know, effects on it. It's kind of magical energy, something. And so um, I worked with them on that and came up with the, the first version of the beam effects and uh, you know they were using it they're they're happy with it and then people in half-life are coming over and like what is that Where did, how did you do that so very quickly that uh, got into half-life the disaster sequence has kind of beam effects all over it and we ended up using it for the, the Vorigons. like there are a bunch of things that we we're doing that we thought would help us tackle the problem of what video games were and what video games were were Boah, also erstens, der ist ein Schrank hier, ne? Das sah gerade aus wie die, diese, diese, diese Bildschirme, Alter. Diese super riesigen, fetten Röhrenbildschirme. Das sind so eine Klassiker. Ich, ich liebe die, ich habe die, hab die damals immer geliebt. Aber erstens, die rumzuschleppen war Pain in the Ass, die irgendwo unterzukriegen, wenn du zur Laden gefahren bist oder zum Kumpel da was aufbauen wolltest. Pain in the Ass, aber irgendwie immer geil. Du, du weißt, du hast das geschafft. Und wenn ich, mir überlege, wenn ich mir überlege, wenn ich heute streamen würde und ich hätte hier vier von denen hier irgendwie übereinander stehen, das wird einfach aussehen wie in so einem komischen dystopischen Matrixraum oder so. Boah, Junge. 
Oh, schön. Und die haben immer so geflimmert. Oh, Junge, das, geht, das ging irgendwann richtig auf die Augen. Wenn du zu lange drauf gesessen, äh, vorgesessen hast, ging es irgendwann immer auf die Augen, weil die hatten so eine Refresh Rate von 10 Hertz oder so, keine Ahnung. Also war, war jedenfalls nicht so gut alles. We're a rapidly changing field, where at the time 90% of video games failed to, to turn Aber keine Heizung gebraucht. Ja, das stimmt. Aber heute auch nicht mehr. Very, mit den profitable, right? So it was, a, it was a field that really valued talent. You know, like I said, Gabe and I brought some people, and then, you know, from there on out, we had to hire people. And, you know, Romero said you got to hire level designers. So, you know, we found some uh, people who had industry experience, um, worked on Rise of the Triad first as a pixel oh. artist, and then went with Duke Nukem, and then everything just went mm. nuts. But I was sitting in my office one day, and, and my... Gibt's von Duke Nukem eigentlich Artbooks? Wenn ich das hier so sehe, warum gibt's denn sowas nicht? Habe ich noch nie gesehen. Das können die nochmal raushauen. My phone rang, just out of the blue, and I pick it up, and it's a recruiter. Eventually, he hooked me up with Gabe, and they flew me up here. It was a big surprise. But then we started looking, you know, the nice thing that we had is we had um, a whole bunch of people in the world who had been working on uh, mods, and so we could... Das ist krass, wie alt Gaben geworden ist. Äh, das Ding ist, K-Fact, das Ding ist, ähm, in der Zeit, wo, wo Gaben, also in den letzten zehn Jahren, zehn Jahre gealtert ist, logisch, äh, bist du auch zehn Jahre gealtert. Du bist in der Zeit genauso viel gealtert wie er. Denk mal drüber nach. Das äh, betrifft uns alle. Da kommen wir alle nicht drum rum. Das, äh, ja, das äh, ist eine traurige Wahrheit, der wir alle ins Auge blicken müssen. Außer ich. Start looking at those folks. And that's where we hired a lot of our designers. Steve and Guthrie, uh, uh, Steve Bond, John Guthrie were my favorite hires by far. Um, uh, other than Doug, <laughs> Gabe sent him an email and they're like, who is a scammer? You know, never heard of these guys. Just kids, like barely 20, I swear. And they show up and they're just the most creative, brilliant. Clever. Oh, yeah. fucking clever. Steve had the magic ability to make stuff fun. The fact that those guys have been hired to go work on, a, on some game for some company, I think that was the start for a lot of people that something cool is going to happen because those guys were already doing stuff that was cool. And then Mark showed up and like Mark actually knows how stories work, you know, beginning, middle, end and all this stuff and... and Mark, uh, warte, ich muss mal kurz... Those guys were already doing stuff that ich was möchte cool. ganz kurz sagen, äh, ja, solche Hemden hatte ich früher auch. Habe ich auch getragen. Es waren, es waren die 90er. Es war, es war okay. Oder waren das schon die 2000? Ich glaube, es waren noch die 90er. Es, 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 es ist okay. Ja, kann man, kann man gemacht haben. Ich glaube, die kommen, die kommen bestimmt auch wieder oder kommen bald. Man weiß nicht genau. And then Mark showed up. And like Mark so nicht actually ja, so work, you know, war eine Zeit, ne? and all this stuff. War eine Zeit. And, and he had all sorts of great ideas. And he was, he ja, also would just you know, bring good ideas out of everybody else as well. Like the person who wrote more code on Half-Life was a chemistry major who decided to be an IP lawyer in Atlanta, right? Was? And he ended up writing more code than anybody else. Was? The creature designer for most of the AI for the, the creatures in the game was a manager at a Waffle House. <laughs> It's not like there are a bunch of people that you could say, oh, this person, you know, has a PhD in video game design. It was that combination of both finding those people <laughs> when it wasn't necessarily easy to find them at that stage in the video game industry, and then also convincing them that it was a better place to work than anybody else. Quiver. The engineer team would modify it greatly over the coming months. Okay. Also, the engine would stark verändern. One of the things that, that I definitely learned uh, was how to hire engineers. And, you know, we needed some engineers. For us anyway, we had licensed ID's engine. You know, we're using the, Qu the Quake engine. And one of the things uh, me and some of the other engineers probably Ken were talking about was if it would be possible to use this, the save system to kind of like join our levels together in a really seamless way. So you get to the end of a level, save stuff, and then load some of it on the next level. Uh, and have it just feel like, you know, the world's all connected. And so we had like every once in a while, 
a hallway or the train would get to a point and you would have a little stop for the level to, to transition. And so he wrote that code leverage on top of just the save load code. Ich muss gerade immer noch darüber nachdenken, dass die Leute äh, alle Quereinsteiger waren. Das geht mir die ganze Zeit noch ein bisschen im Kopf rum. Und ich frage mich gerade, ich denke da ein bisschen drauf rum und ich frage mich gerade, wie viele Leute wohl in irgendwelchen Jobs stecken, ähm, die sie gemacht haben, weil es oder die sie angenommen haben, weil es vernünftige Jobs äh, sind natürlich. Also ne, hat ein Auskommen, bla, äh, kannst alles bezahlen, pipapo. Ähm, aber wo dann vielleicht zum Beispiel ein großartiger Spieledesigner verloren gegangen ist, in Anführungszeichen, der sich vielleicht woanders komplett ganz anders kreativ hätte ausleben können, hätte er den vernünftigen Job nicht genommen. Ich kann mir vorstellen, ich kann mir vorstellen, dass es so sehr, sehr vielen Leuten gibt, die wahrscheinlich sehr kreativ sind äh, oder sich auch sehr kreativ ausleben und dann äh, irgendwie vom Leben eingeholt werden. Und vielleicht auch von, von Bekannten, Verwandten, was auch immer, die dann sagen, ja, aber mach das Vernünftige, mach das Vernünftige. Das ist, langfristig ist das besser. Vernünftig, du musst vernünftig sein. Ich will jetzt nichts sagen, ne? Also vielleicht, vielleicht sind es auch immer nur die, die man sieht, aber die Leute, die mit irgendwas erfolgreich werden oder die, die sich irgendwas trauen, die, die unvernünftig sind, ich habe immer das Gefühl, dass die es irgendwie, wahrscheinlich nicht immer, aber dass die es etwas, dass die folgen ihren Träumen und die, führen etwas nach vorne, sage ich mal. Schlecht zu formulieren. Es ist schwierig zu formulieren, und dass man es falsch versteht. Die bringen etwas nach vorne jedenfalls. Vielleicht aber sieht man auch nur die, die wirklich was nach vorne bringen und viele fallen hinten über, wie das halt äh, in allen Branchen so ist. Das kann natürlich auch sein. Innovation braucht Pioniere, ganz genau. So ist es. Ja. Also, ja. Ähm, vielleicht manchmal gar nicht so schlecht, vielleicht doch mal Quereinsteiger unter die Lupe zu nehmen. Und sich nicht immer nur auf, äh, auf Sachen zu verlassen, die halt wirklich schon, ähm, dass man Leute einstellt, die äh, mit zehn Jahren Erfahrung oder sonst irgendwas vielleicht, vielleicht äh, doch ganz gut Quereinsteiger mal unter die Lupe zu nehmen. To, to do the transitions, and I think in Half-Life 1 we got most of the transitions were you know, a second or two. Now, I remember when we da werde ich noch ein bisschen drauf rumdenken, glaube ich, später. Like, hey, we don't have to have all our textures fit in a certain, you know, 256 hm. colors. That was a huge liberation. To, the two tech investments we made for Half-Life was to get to 16-bit color oh. and Mit skeletal animation for all the monsters. But at the time, it was completely revolutionary. Your, your Quake characters were, it's like a text file of vertex positions over time. I wanted so much more animation, and I wanted it to the animators to, to have the freedom to put in <laughs> 100, 200, 500 frame of, of animation, if not more. And then you can do all sorts of other things because you have a skeleton, so it's like, oh, I can hook on a gun to a character. Um, I can start to make changes of characters and replay the same. Animation or re das Problem ist, dass man jegliche Sicherheit verliert, wenn man die Branche wechselt. Frag mal die Mitarbeiter bei Riot. Ja gut, vielleicht ein schlechtes Beispiel, weil es die Gaming-Branche ist, aber äh, generell, ich, das mit der Sicherheit ist so ein Thema, das wurde mir auch immer gesagt, ähm, ob das mit der Selbstständigkeit ist doch viel zu unsicher, ist doch viel zu unsicher, wurde mir immer wieder gesagt. Und meine Antwort darauf war immer, ja, aber wenn ich irgendwo im Job bin, kann ich auch jederzeit fliegen. So, das ist so, ich, ich, da habe ich ja gar keine, da habe ich doch gar keine, da, da habe ich doch selber gar keinen Einfluss drauf. Wenn ich dann irgendwann gekündigt werde, dann bin ich halt raus und ich kann ja halt nichts machen. So. Wenn ich aber selbstständig bin, dann habe ich es vielleicht noch zum Teil selbst in der Hand. Was auch nicht so wirklich stimmt, weil manchmal, ne, ist einfach so. Aber, <lacht> Standbild. <lacht> ja, das mit, der, das mit der Sicherheit ist, ähm, einige haben sicherlich einen sichereren Job als andere. Aber, ja, das, das Problem ist, glaube ich, das Risiko, auch egal wo, die riskantesten Dinge bringen manchmal die, ich sag mal, leckersten Früchte, aber sind eben auch am riskantesten. Man kann alles gewinnen oder alles verlieren. Je nachdem. Use most of the same model, so we can swap out heads, we can oh swap out this, we can swap out whatever. Like, was, was, was war das für ein Brustkasten einfach? <lacht> so, guck mal hier. Dieser Brustkasten. Sicherheit ist, einen Abschluss zu haben. <lacht> ich finde es gut, dass wir auch äh, Leute hier haben, die einen guten Humor teilen. Das finde ich hervorragend. So, äh, jedenfalls, was ist das für ein Brustkasten hier? Da kannst du ein Bier drauf abstellen. Like Junge, Junge. All the technology that went into the game to make it as fun as it is, was not available one generation before. So, licensing the Quake Engine, which was, you know, very mature and had level designers who'd grown up just goofing around with it. Hm? I wasn't heavily into scripting Oh, since back into Doom. Like my old Doom levels have a lot of weird odd events in them. I think I asked Ken, is it possible that I could 
you know, have access to the character's animation, like a trigger. Like what I mentioned, I could make the guys go into an animation, I could make them run, mm -hmm. and then I would configure everything. It was all hack. This is total hacky stuff. I'm a guy. And, um, and that is mostly what I built, was like things like characters reacting and jumping out are made to look like, or I push, I'd use a push brush to throw a head crab out to make it look like it launched at something. Or if a loud <laughs> sound happened, <laughs> they would respond, would, yeah. Would, would cower. So, Gabe's dictate was, as you walked forward, something needs to happen like every three to five seconds. Yeah. The player stands still, the Didn't have to be much. universe can be quiet, but if they move forward, if they're active, the universe needs to play back something, needs to do something, even if it is yeah. a scripted sequence or, or even just an interesting sign or sign something. or a sound yeah. or some vignette or something. So I came up with this interaction method where you could do little AIs where the characters would talk and interact with you a little bit. And wenn ich das so wenn ich das so gucke, also ne, die haben gerade gesagt, äh, Gabe's order war äh, immer wenn man immer wenn man sich bewegt, wenn man nach vorne geht, sollte am besten alle drei bis fünf Sekunden sollte irgendwas sein. Nicht eine große Sequenz, sondern auch nur eine Kleinigkeit, irgendein Geräusch, irgendwas Kleines, bla bla bla, vielleicht nur ein Schild, aber es sollte irgendwas irgendwas sollte da sein. Und dann denke ich halt an heutige Open-World-Games. Ich denke dann einfach an heutige Open-World-Games, die unfassbar gut aussehen, fantastisch und so weiter. Und dann musst du dann musst du halt Sachen abgrinden auf der Map und dann von A nach B und dann... Ja. Das ist leider... Das ist leider... Hmm. Then we wanted to do Spectacle. Uh, and that was scripted sequences, where you could tell a character, you need to run here and then jump into this animation. Um, and then Starfield have is a bunch of you all synchronize your animation, because it's somebody flying through the air, or they're smashing something, or they're doing something like that. Mm. Yeah, and then test it and figure out, like, oh, this is real easy to break. That was the yeah. roughest thing about scripted sequences, where you'd have like a head crab jumping on a scientist or something, and it's like, yeah, it works totally fine 90% of the time, but some people just sprint right at the scientist and sometimes we have to put them behind glass. Mm -mm -mm. And sometimes getting the, the level designers making the player want to do the thing that gives them the most fun is a very subtle art. The tentacle sequence is probably the one I, I remember the most. You're playing it, right? That yeah. was the first time I think they melded together. Because you had your trigger. So closely. And, and we, wanted, we wanted it to be triggered. So by the time you start to see it, you see the scientist flying through the air and hitting the wall. Then you could, you could look in and you could see the scientist being carried away. The, the tentacle itself is separate. It's on its own. And you bring the two together, mesh them together, and boom. It felt so seamless, though. And that, yeah. for me, is like... Moments like that, and that might have been the first one, is mm -hmm. when you start to saw, see the, the scripted events and play start to blend a little bit more than just ambience. For God's sake, open the metal door! They're coming for us! It's our only way out! Oh my God, we're doomed! <laughs> I remember Brett in particular had done some of the lab scenes. Bisschen slapstick is it schon, oder? That's schon, komm, bisschen ist dabei. They just, it gave them a little bit of life. Oh, a ton shoot. of the work that went into that area was because <laughs> we knew it was going to be the beginning of the game and we really needed to make it a vibrant and interesting, fun place to be and explore. So originally they were designed to sort of be behind glass. They were just designed to be spectacle. Yeah, a little vignette. And then all of the level designers like, no, no, I'm going to put that right in front die, die of you. Was like, das oh God. How am I supposed to make this work? It's not supposed to do it. Get away from there, Freeman. I'm expecting an important message. The, the run speed mm. for the player was so insane. Yeah. It was like, what, 25 miles an hour or it something? Was, it was sprinting, it was... <laughs> you could get so far, so fast. And so you'd either have to make the script of sequence like so quick that you could... But I think the Laufgeschwindigkeit, yeah, so unrealistic as it is, it has something. Die, das hat viel für Half-Life getan, aber damals auch viel für Doom. Dass du einfach so wirklich rennen konntest, rennen, reagieren, rennen, reagieren, nicht nachdenken, zwischendurch wieder Sequenz oder irgendwie wieder das sehen und so weiter. Ähm, das, das macht schon was. Das fühlt sich sehr gut an beim Spielen einfach. Und vor allem muss es sich you flüssig know, anfühlen. Get their attention with like a particle or a sound or lighting or something. And then you wanted them to see what was happening. But when when we play tested, uh, and it's like a scientist was like being pulled into a vent or something, like people wouldn't just stop and like, oh. Sometimes they would be like, oh wow, look at that. 
They just like just run straight ahead and just start <laughs> shooting. It's hard when you think back to it to recognize that those kind of interactive moments were so new. Like people just hadn't seen them. It was worth it because no other games were doing that. No other games had that interactivity. No other games had that spectacle playing out in front of you. Uh, and it just added that whole feel of Half-Life. Gabe had Geil. started to develop this theory so simple, aber so gut einfach. interactivity and the environment needed to let you do what you wanted and then react to it. So if you did something, if you shot your gun, there needed to be a bullet hole in the wall. If you did a thing, people needed, you know, other characters needed to react. You know, the world is acknowledging you exist. The world is acknowledging all of your actions. And that's this huge part of reinforcement. And you'd have these conversations where you'd be sitting in a design review and somebody'd say, that's not realistic. And you're like, okay, what does that have to, like, explain to me why that's interesting. Because in the real world, <laughs> I have to write up lists of stuff I have to go to the grocery store to buy. And I have never thought to myself that realism is fun. I go play games to have fun. And so we had to come up. Das ist so eine wichtige Aussage, gerade in gerade heutzutage. Das ist so eine wichtige Aussage. Ich will, ich, wenn ich spiele, dann will ich nichts mit der Realität zu tun haben. Ich möchte auch keine, es sei denn, das Spiel handelt davon, dann ist es okay, aber ich, ne, also, also kümmert sich darum, aber ich möchte keine tagesaktuellen Themen oder sonst irgendwas, ich möchte nichts von der Welt da draußen da drin haben. Ich möchte einfach da eine in sich funktionierende Welt, die nach den Regeln der Welt funktioniert und nicht nach irgendwelchen Regeln hier draußen oder sonst irgendwo. Genau, ich möchte immersiert sein einfach da drin. Fertig. In einer glaubwürdigen Welt. Mehr nicht. Das möchte ich haben. Das ist so, das ist so wichtig. Weil das ist halt der Eskapismus, den wir alle, den wir alle frühen. Bei Filmen genauso. Absolut das gleiche bei Filmen. Ja, ich, ich habe nichts dagegen, wenn, wenn Themen von, ich sag mal von außerhalb, ja, aus der, aus der richtigen Welt verarbeitet werden, aber dann A, mach es richtig, mach, dass es Spaß macht, ja, und ähm, mach das nicht immer so lehrmeisterhaft von oben, so ähm, und B, dann muss es auch mit dem Spiel zu tun haben. Und nicht irgendwie einfach nur drin sein, um, um, um irgendwen anzusprechen, dass es irgendwie einfach nur drin ist, äh, so rudimentär reingequetscht, um irgendwem gefallen zu wollen. Das, äh, ja, Pandarism, da wären wir wieder bei South Park, Entschuldigung, ich habe das auch gesehen, aber es passt halt sehr gut. Ja, und das, ich finde das immer so ein bisschen dann bei manchen Spielen finde ich so billig reingeschoben, so billig umgesetzt, einfach nur, um, um das Thema, um sich selbst damit irgendwie zu brüsten, dass man irgendwelche, irgendwelche Themen verarbeitet hat. Und das finde ich dann immer so ein bisschen so A, low effort und B, das hat doch mit der Welt nichts zu tun. So, das ist so, ma, mach es richtig, wenn. Können wir jetzt einen ganzen Talk draus machen. Aber wichtige Aussage recognizes and responded to the player's choices and actions, right? You know, in behavioral science, you would say we were explicitly talking about what were reinforcers and what the reinforcement schedules were, right? At that point in time, that was a useful way of making design decisions. The point I would make is, if I go up to a wall and shoot it, it me, to me, it feels like the wall is ignoring me. I'm getting a narcissistic injury when the world is ignoring me. <laughs> so it is, like, to me, I was trying to convey to the user a sense of, yes, you were making choices, yes, you were progressing, which meant the game had to acknowledge that back to you. If you shoot at a wall, there have to be decals. If you kill a bunch of Marines, the Marines have to run away from you, right? You have to have this sense of the game acknowledging and responding to the, the choices and actions and progressions that you've made. Krasse Überlegung. Also allein, allein die bullet holes in der Wand ist einfach so ein so ein winziges Detail, aber es macht halt wirklich auch einen krassen Unterschied. Also es ist wirklich gute, gute Überlegung. Ich weiß nicht, was ich das sonst sagen soll. Ähm, Sachen, wo man vielleicht so gar nicht drüber nachdenkt und Sachen, die man oft einfach als selbstverständlich sieht, das ist schon krass. Otherwise, it loses any, any sort of impact. Details immer mega wichtig, bei allem. Details sind immer das Beste. 80-20-Regel ist immer kacke, aber die 20% am Ende, die 80% der Zeit kosten, machen, halt, machen halt oft den Unterschied. Wir waren auf der gleichen Seite in Terms of what the game should look like, which would be just sort of alien in a very naturalistic kind of way. Like these are, these are creatures from another dimension, another planet, that look like they 
evolved in a way. And, and Chuck had a very, he came from Duke Nukem. He made a bunch of monsters that <laughs> went in a, sort of a different direction. And um, for a while, the game had a hard time coalescing around a single vision. All the ones that looked like genitals were Ted's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and all the ones with shiny bits that looked like alien soldiers were, were Chuck's. That was, that was a thing when I first came in, yeah. Ted's style and, and mine. And trying um, to figure that out. Trying to find the, the harmony between the two to make it work. Yeah. Ted had, he was, he, he really liked the Wayne Barlow aesthetic and I had a little <laughs> bit different, but it, it worked great. Ted made these really weird, he did the, uh, the, uh, the head crab, you know, that, that's pretty much the symbol of it all. Yeah, and, uh, and I remember t taking his head crab and putting it on a scientist and making the zombie. Right. Well, we pretty much have, we talked and it's like, okay, we'll do, you do that. And, and um, Ted did the soldiers, I did the scientists. Um, I did a lot of the, uh, the, the, the... Aber allein, allein schon die Combo, dass es die Headcrabs gibt und es gibt die Soldiers. Und dann gibt es aber noch Combo aus beidem, wo die Headcrab quasi den toten Körper des Soldiers steuert als, als Gegner. Auch das ist halt super nice. Auch das tut halt viel viel für die Welt, also nicht viel für die Welt da draußen, ja, aber viel für die Glaubwürdigkeit der Welt. Ähm, ich, ist einfach, es ist so simpel, aber so genial einfach. Und, und du kannst das Thema noch immer, immer fortführen mit Parasiten, die Körper übernehmen und dann sonst was passiert. Es muss nur glaubhaft sein und so. Es ist schon genau Worldbuilding. Ein Thema, über das ich ja neulich erst gerne geredet habe. Ähm, Worldbuilding ist so ein geiles Thema und man kann so viel machen und ein gefühlt oft etwas äh, rudimentär erforschtes Feld. Aliens. And with the Hornet Gun. I did, did the Hornet Gun for that one as well too. You know, the, the alien slave. Well, I did some animations for the bull squid or bull chicken. I, I have to call him that. Um, but that, that, that's a Ted creature there. Uh, the hound eye was, was Ted's as well. Yeah, a lot of the fleshy. If it's got a, like, over, like, a lot of flesh on it, maybe too much. Yeah, that's, that's, Ted. that's, a, that's a Tedism. You can always tell Ted's designs um, because they're, they're much more uh, aquarium than uh, aquarium and or, you know, like, Unspeakables. Oh. Uh, you know. oh, Big Mama! I forgot about Big Mama. <lacht> oh God! You know, it's a testicle, right? It's like so yeah. disturbed. Testicle? Ich habe gedacht, man wird da verd verd drin verdaut. Concepted a guy in sort of a NASA spacesuit, a scientist guy. He was actually modeled after a couple of programmers I know. Big beefy bearded Linux programmers, mm -hmm. you know. Man and so that's where the yeah. HEV suit sort of emerged <lacht> out of. There was a lot of desire for. Not having a space marine or a soldier be be the guy, and then Chuck Jones went off and did a pretty different version of him that became known as <laughs> Ivan the Space Bike. Ja, ich habe Unix selbst compiled. So. <laughs> Schön und wirft aber mit AOL-CDs um sich so. Oh God! I remember telling myself, it's like anytime you make a screenshot. Make sure it's good, because you don't know <laughs> where this is going to appear again. We didn't know that. And Ivan is the prime example of that one. Sure, so, you know, you're, you're looking at it. Well, go look at Quake. It's like, okay, I'm looking at that. And he's got this incredibly boxy Sorry. head. And you're always hearing, don't put too many polys <laughs> in it. And it's like, okay, so Ivan got the, the, the square head. And it was kind of an early, just a rough prototype of a, of a Gordon Freeman baby. And I remember... Um, <laughs> We didn't know what Gordon looked like. So it's like, I, I, I was looking for somebody and I found Mike Harrington. It's like, Mike, what, what does Gordon look like? Is I, I don't know, put yourself in there. It's like, oh, okay, okay. And so I went in and, and put kind of my likeness on the early <laughs> Gordon model in, in the game. And it, it kind of stayed Did there. You <laughs> I, well, I was ex tattoo artist, so yeah, I definitely had that. I, I don't, I don't have anything to work with now, but yeah, that, that point I had a ponytail on if it. You play I remember you got a mixed pain. Play the game, you know that it's Chuck. If you play multiplayer and you yeah. see the model, it's But yeah, if you look on the back of that, there's this little like yeah, four yeah. triangles and he's got a little <laughs> little ponytail back there. I did the G-Man. And again, that one was, Gabe was talking about the cigarette man from X-Files. So we needed our own equivalent of that. Because after... Munter ans Werk, Mr. Freeman. Munter ans Werk, die deutsche Version. Alter, ich, boah, die ist nicht gut gealtert. Die ist so furchtbar. For a while, oh. after playing with the game for a whole, uh, for a long time, people realized, like, hey, oh. we made this character and <laughs> blah, blah, just blah, in this blah, one Mr. office Freeman. scene in the beginning, you know, where he's behind the window and he's talking to a scientist or something, and he's like, he looks really creepy. Uh, it was late in the day that we thought, oh, okay, well, he's going to be the big bad behind all of this. 
like scatter him around in, air, in, in places that you can't get to him, but he's there mysteriously. There wasn't enough in the beginning of the game. It's like, we need another monster. Head crabs weren't, weren't enough. Um, it was, got kind of repetitious. I think I grabbed a, a, a Ted and said, I need them to do this and this. <clears throat> and so he whipped it out in not much time at all. I, I'm gonna get the timing just right. Uh, and I have no time to do this. So I'm just gonna bang it out. Um, and then once it was working. Wenn ich die Doku so sehe, ich würde mir, würd mir so gern, ich hätte so gern eine Doku über das erste Prey Game. Das von 1990 irgendwas, keine Ahnung. Das, Neue auch cool, ja, aber vom Alten, da waren so viele geile Gameplay-Ideen drin. Holy shit. Und die meisten davon hat man nie wieder gesehen in irgendeinem anderen Spiel. Da waren so geile Sachen drin. Wenn ich euch irgendein Retro-Game, irgendein Retro-Shooter empfehlen kann, falls ihr mal einen sucht, ähm, das erste Prey ist so krass. Da sind so krasse Ideen drin. Mit ähnlich, Portals waren dann teilweise auch schon drin, lange Zeit vor Portals, aber dann teilweise auch Portals, wo du plötzlich ganz klein bist in irgendeinem irgendein Schaukasten zum Beispiel, den du dann aber auch, wenn du wieder zurückgehst, von außen sehen kannst. Und das ist absurd. Und wenn dann Feinde vor dem Schaukasten stehen, sind die auf einmal riesig groß. Oder wenn die das Port durchs Portal gehen, sind die winzig klein da drin. Und so, Boah, Alter, so geil. So ein krasses, geiles Game. Leider kompletter Underdog. Also, wenn ich euch was empfehlen kann, das erste Prey, richtig geil. War das, 2000, war das 2006? War das nicht 1990 irgendwas? Okay, dann von 2006. Okay, ja, also kann ich euch wirklich empfehlen. Ist, die Grafik ist vielleicht ein bisschen klobig inzwischen, ja, aber äh, ist wirklich extrem gut gealtert. Everybody said, oh, ein Unterhund. Let's go back and sprinkle them back in the, in the maps. Um, mm. And that was yeah, this... Yeah, because then we introduced them a little earlier than we yeah, were planning. Them. Yeah, because they, like, they, oh, they, cool. they, they weren't real tough. They weren't supposed to be tough. But they were ranged. But they were ranged, and they were fun, and they had a big show, and like, that was showing off a bunch of stuff. Yeah. the assassin like came in pretty late <laughs> that was it it was like okay i have a week and a half it was already done it was already all modeled already all animated and the requirement was it couldn't have any new animations and any new anything so I had to come up i grabbed a bunch of steve bond's ai and bang that thing out i built a level super crude uh but it had all the right spacing and all the right heights and all the right you know geometry again it's just a presentation where this this creature gets to shine, this, this enemy gets to shine, and is your entire focus for that scene. And it's kind of a memorable experience because it just takes place in a different fashion than other encounters, you know, and you get knocked out and there's all kinds of like, the lights go out and, and you get dragged through a corridor and things. So again, it's something you remember in the game. We just did a lot of playtesting and did a lot of level building and used all of the monsters and you used everything that we had developed and started seeing which ones kind of stuck out a little oddly. You know, like we had the hound eyes that Ted had concepted and Kelly had done great sounds for them. And so they, they, they seemed like a very oddly plausible sort of alien creature. And Chuck did uh, what we... Okay, sehen auf dem Bild noch ein bisschen krasser aus, würde ich sagen, oder? <lacht> da ist schon ein bisschen Unterschied. Vielleicht kann man, vielleicht gibt es davon mal irgendwann eine Remastered-Version oder so. Called the Panther Eye, which was this big black panther looking uh, creature that also just had a big red eye for his face and a big shark fin coming out the back. And design-wise, he seemed like a, oh, this is a very useful creature, you know, it's like when you design things you know you like to have a gradient of difficulty a gradient of uh, escalation and threat ich dachte gerade die kleinen soll das sein aber trotzdem ich würde gern da, davon würde ich wirklich gern offizielles remaster sehen and so if we had these hound eyes and oh yes this like panther bigger uh, scarier looking black, thing ja, black mesa gibt es aber would ja, be more es of a existiert es black mesa inzwischen äh, voll voll draußen ich habe mal irgendwann ähm, einen Status Quo damals gespielt, aber da fehlten noch, ich weiß gar nicht, 30 Prozent oder so. Ist, ist, schon, ist schon durch, okay. Okay, schon länger sogar. Na gut, okay, okay, okay. Also Black Mesa. Ja, 
okay. Voll geil. Schon sehr, sehr geil. Uh, it was in the game for a long time and then ich irgendwie nicht mehr weiter sort of just worked its durch, also way out uh, because folks couldn't find a way to incorporate a creature like that into the environment and make it seem reasonable. Uh, the Stuka bat was, um, it was something that I had did, uh, uh, just a weird, another creature from the air. We had the chub toad that we were going to use as a feeding animal to help. Edward. And um, yeah, they, they had a mechanic to where they were going to use this to distract monsters so you could possibly get by. And uh, it, it pretty much reached you know, fruition to where we created the... Ich würde mir auch wirklich gerne einen neuen Teil von Sin wünschen. Sin hat auch unfassbar viel Spaß gemacht. Object, but then again, time became Aber leider war ein Episodenspiel gestorben damals. Ich weiß gar nicht, von wem das war. I grew up just outside DC and, and so there's all these like big, really banal office buildings and, and that's kind of the direction I went. Kingpin war auch geil, also, also Kingpin war richtig geil damals, aber da kam jetzt irgendwie so eine neue Version raus. Ähm, ich habe die bis jetzt noch nicht angespielt, aber die hat sehr schlechte, ganz furchtbare Steam-Bewertung. Keine Troll-Bewertung, sondern reale, habe ich unten gelesen, aber kein, kein gutes Remake. So it started becoming a facility. And so I started making these kind of linoleum tiles and the, the drop ceiling, the, the concrete block wall, the black and white tile floor. She was like the texture artist Krass. for a long, like for most of the game. Yeah. It's just an overmelt, overwhelming amount of work. Und eine unfassbar gute Arbeit. Also man muss einfach sagen, ähm, man, man übersieht es gerne, aber die, die ganzen Texturen, also die ganzen Grafiken, auf die man rumläuft, Böden, Wände, blablabla, absolut ikonisch. Absolut ikonisch. All of the textures. And you can really see a shift in some of them, where they go from handpainted to photo reference. There's, the photo references are much, much better. So I, I was all over Seattle, um, Harbor Island, Gasworks Park, um, getting rusty metal things. What can I get good pictures of that is vaguely industrial and um, interesting to look at and then how can we use this <laughs> and so you know sides of box cars and I, I don't know how many hallways in half-life are you know the side of a train car kind of thing the Kirkland Costco a lot, lot of time in the Kirkland Costco uh, getting uh, just packages <laughs> of I don't know why I needed um, snacks or something The first Oha. year was all about opportunity, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, you know, it wasn't quite as focused. We were trying, we were finding our footing. We were getting into the three months before supposedly shipping in 97, and it's like, this isn't gelling. This is yeah. really not good. This is like, you know, quick knockoff, cash grab, stupid. And let's not do that. There was a lot of disconnect between what all of the different groups were doing, what engineering was doing and what level design was doing and what animation was doing. We had a bunch of monsters that had no plans to get in the game because nobody else was assigned to work on them. And we had a bunch of levels that like, what's supposed to go in here? Oh, I don't know. Everybody's going to do a bunch of stuff. And like, no, that doesn't work that way. Yeah. So here we were, all these people doing all these cool things and just everything's just this random collection of, oh, here's a cool moment and a cool this and, you know, and then it's gone and, you know, oh, now on to the next thing. Because the way we were building the game was, Every level designer was kind of his own silo, his own universe. Uh, and I think that just grew out of our, you know, kind of mod developer roots. But it wasn't cohesive and it certainly didn't have a, you know, a strategy for like maximizing any of that stuff. You must have been in the meeting when we reviewed all the levels. It was like the first time everybody piled into a room. Also quasi jeder, die waren alle super kreativ, aber jeder hat seinen eigenen Scheiß gemacht. Uh, es gab aber irgendwie keine richtige gemeinsame Vision und es gab irgendwie drei, ja, drei Monate vor Release gab es immer noch kein gutes, unterhaltsames Game. Right. And Gabe had his crazy Hellraiser chair with the beautiful <lacht> Mac und monitor. Drei Monate sind echt and play, for two days he played Uff. everyone's levels. But I remember one moment he turned around, he was like this with his hair, he's going, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail, we're gonna fail. <lacht> and I was just like, oh. I was, it blew me yeah. away. I was like, oh shit, this isn't good. You know, we were doing our best trying to make this, this game and the story. And, you know, we had a schedule from Sierra. Ach ja, das kam noch über Sierra raus. 
Stimmt, ja. Sierra, um euch abzuholen, ja, die haben früher King's Quest und sowas gemacht, was ich auf dem Retro-Channel gespielt habe, der schon viel zu lange äh, brach liegt. Ähm, die, die haben früher so Text Adventures gemacht, Pipapo, haben dann auch äh, gepublished und so. Und die haben auch die ersten Ultimas äh, gepublished und aber auch Half-Life gepublished. Und das ist, äh, puh. And it was a tight die SWAT teile auch, ja, them, like, We're not gonna ship this. And we realized that you're not gonna pay us to continue developing this, but we're going to do it anyway. Late is just for a little while, suck is forever, right? We could try to... Stimmt, Diablo 1 war auch Sierra, 4 auch. 4 auch, die Völker, die Völker? Weiß ich gar nicht, aber auf jeden Fall Sierra, Pharao und so, äh, die haben eine Menge Stuff rausgehauen. Ähm... Und es gibt, es gibt noch ein Buch, warum Sierra dann äh, schließlich wo die Hunde gegangen ist. Ähm, es ist ein ganz trauriges Kapitel über, ich glaube, Investoren, Krawatten, Macht, Gier, bla bla bla. Und dann wurde das ganze Unternehmen gegen die Wand gefahren. Es ist einfach, es ist einfach, es ist so sad. Force this thing out the door. Uh, so. But that's not the Warte, ich muss, ich muss kurz äh, Gabes Weisheit wieder lauschen. This, but we're going to do it anyway. Late is just for a little while, suck is forever, right? <lacht> Late is just for a little while, suck is forever, right? Ja, yeah. ja. Yeah. Das sind wahre, wahre, wahre Worte. Wobei, es gibt Ausnahmen. Cyberpunk hat inzwischen seine Reputation zurück und No Man's Sky. Ja, aber die haben Jahre gebraucht. Wortwörtlich Jahre und sehr viele kostenlose Updates. We could try to force this thing out the door. Uh, but that's not the company we want to be. That's not the people we want to be. That's not the relationship we want to have with our customers. And so we kind of Kelly and I kind of sat down and and sort of tried to take an inventory of all the cool stuff we had built and why weren't we just, you know, building uh, more on top of that and and you know, those Discussions kind of led to our us building this kind of uh, design cabal process to try to give some cohesion to the game and kind of changing the way we were approaching it. And so a cabal was a, um, a small group of people, a multidisciplinary group. You know, there's like an art, you know, artists, you know, level designers, engineers, and you know everything in in that. And a small team that would write up a spec for a you know a level. You know, there was the arc um, uh, that you know Mark had written, so we knew how that fit into the story. And, and we got a small group of people together and we started with the beginning and we went through how literally what map do we need to build to tell us the story we're going to have to tell and then what does that connect to and what's the next piece and the next piece the strongest and most influential thing that came out of them was to me the sketches and they were really the visual meeting notes right und das in drei monaten das in drei monaten zu stemmen alles was man hat irgendwie sinnvoll und mit einer story und allem zusammenzukleben Boah, das, das muss man wirklich erstmal schaffen. Ich, ich, glaube, ich glaube, die haben gut reingecrunched damals und es war denen wahrscheinlich auch egal. Right. We came up with a formula for how that worked. We had a certain percentage of the time where you were fighting, a certain percentage of the time where you're exploring, a certain percentage of the time where you're solving puzzles. And so we could apply that uniformly through the game and that worked pretty well. Good morning and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. The whole opening of the game was specifically a reaction to how all the other first person shooters were, whether they had cutscenes or or not. Like sometimes like they would just open without a cutscene, but you know, you're standing in a room with a gun and you're gonna there's a thing attacking you. So we could look at examples of all that, and I think there was expectation that that's what Half-Life had to do because every other game was doing it. I can tell you the number of people who started up the game, were staring at it, and then accidentally bumped their mouse and realized this is live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as simple as that sounds, it was mind-blowing for so many people because it was too much going on. This isn't real time, this is a recording, you know. That was sort of the way we, you know, stumbled through a lot of the new narrative tricks was like, well, what can we do that you could do this in a movie or a story, but nobody's doing this in first person shooters. You're this anonymous scientist and you're writing on this 
train and to work and rolled the credits at the beginning. It was kind of like a cinematic experience almost. Like I don't think games had really gone down that road. It's so funny to look at it now because it's so Voll primitive. Geil. But at the time, Wollte it felt like really in this black piece of the world. Pre-disaster survived from the first year. So, so a lot of that geometry was from that first version of the game, uh, but in a very minimal way, right? Just some the basic style of some of the hallways, the curved corners in the hallways, things like that. They more became sort of like Lego pieces that John could use and stitch together and extrude. And I know Brett did a lot of the raw geometry from pre-disaster, and then John did most of the work to ship it, and then the post and the train ride was all John, I think. The Sector C, so those are heavily influenced by NASA control rooms with my favorite green hammerite um, really influenced a lot of like the starting we started with the kind of the consoles <laughs> so zoos I'm trying to remember and then there was just lots of hallways and people were getting lost and I did the color stripes to help people follow them places one of the things that was actually super exciting was how quotidian a lot of it really was Rating. you know the lunchroom with the microwave you press the button and it goes flat My God, what are you doing? Aber das sind halt die geilsten Sachen in Games. Das sind also, also gerade bei Shootern und so, wenn du mit irgendwas interagieren kannst und du kriegst eine Reaktion, das sind die allergeilsten Sachen. Und das war halt, ähm, ich komme wieder mit meinem alten Stuff, ja, das war immer das Geheimnis von Ultima, wo man quasi sau viele Sachen in der Welt einfach bewegen konnte, benutzen konnte, ähm, kombinieren konnte, dann kam wieder was raus und daraus kannst du wieder was anderes machen und so. Ähm, das alles zu entdecken und das alles, das, das, ja genau, das macht die Welt einfach unfassbar lebendig und nicht so statisch. Ähm, so kleine Sachen, so viele Details und es ist einfach, es, es bringt einfach so viel und diese Kleinigkeiten werden so oft außer Acht gelassen, was so schade ist, weil gerade diese kleinen Spielereien halt nochmal Spiele innerhalb, oder Spielereien eben innerhalb der Spiele sind, was es eben noch schöner macht, einfach da zu sein. Yeah, all this work, so you can start Max Payne auch so viel zum Anklicken, ja. ja, ja. Duke Nukem auch because that happened regularly. Like, we oh, regularly right. accidentally blew up. It was blew. mostly, wasn't it? There were a few people who were just, um, you know, challenged with kitchen appliances. And, um, <laughs> you know, at one point we had a company fire. <laughs> we, yeah. had, we had a lot right, of things yeah. going on in that kitchen. All of that stuff had a real kind of eloquence that um, in the late 90s, in a world where everything was so over the top, you know. But we still got to go on Flights of Fancy. Welcome to the HEV Mark IV. I think like a super pivotal moment for me uh, was when we came in this one morning and we saw the test chamber sequence that um, Kelly and um, John Guthrie and Wedge was in that office and um, Dario Driller, they were all in this corner dark office where so much cool stuff happened. But so uh, Kelly and John stayed up all night and did the test chamber sequence and it's pretty much like the one we shipped. I mean that was a lot of what went on in that room that we called the submarine. It was just improvisation, you know, just what can we do to solve this problem? How do we connect what's happening before to what's happening after? This needs to be somehow important but we just don't know what to do. John and I talked about it. I went home that night and I sort of sketched out like, you know, maybe we could do something cinematic. We'll take the camera away, we'll turn the lights off, we'll do sounds, we'll just throw everything we can at it. You know, we built that basically that day. You know, it was just a sort of a one day throw it together. Unfassbar. That's how fast we were moving. They had audio, Unfassbar. right? They had yeah, the yeah. It's like the heartbeat and the breathing, all that stuff was in there. And I played through it and it was like... Hört sich doof an. Ja, also damals gab es nicht so viel Technik wie heute. Aber ich glaube, damals war es noch einfacher, Spieler zu beeindrucken. Heute ist das, ich glaube, die Ansprüche sind über die Jahre sehr, sehr, sehr stark geschrieben, äh, gestiegen. Ähm, zumindest so was Sequenzen und sowas angeht, äh, die Qualität von Sequenzen und so. Nicht mal so sehr, was Spielereien angeht. Ich glaube, das hat, die, das hat über die Jahre gelitten. Ich glaube, da hatten wir früher mehr in Games als heute. Ähm, ich glaube, mit solchen Kleinigkeiten könnte man heute auch sehr viel bewegen. Ähm, wenn man einfach Spieler Spielereien zur Verfügung stellt, äh, die, sie, die sie machen können. Ähm, ich habe das Gefühl, das ist so ein, so ein Punkt, der in sehr vielen Spielen, wo sich Leute nicht rantrauen, weil sie Angst haben, dass eventuell das was vom Gameplay wegnimmt oder so. Weil sie wollen, dass der Spieler das erlebt ja, und nicht irgendwelche seine, seine eigenen Sperenzien vielleicht macht. 
Ja. Und auch, genau, heute hat man eine größere Auswahl an Spielen, nicht nur das, aber auch die Technik hat sich halt unfassbar weiterentwickelt. Unfassbar weiterentwickelt. Damn, I have not seen this in man gab es mit weniger zufrieden, weil man nicht mehr kannte. Naja, aber das war damals schon, das war damals schon Peak-Technik halt, ne? Also alleine, alleine 3D-Grafik, wow, mit 3DFX und so, boah. Und dann halt noch eine Story, die erzählt wird und dann noch so das mit dem Intro, wo man gesehen hat, ne, man kann sich selber bewegen im Intro, was man noch nie gesehen hat. Deswegen hat auch keiner die Maus bewegt, weil, ne? Und wenn du dann plötzlich dieses, die, die Maus bewegt hast, dann ist es für dich so, so ein Eye-Opener, einfach so, wow, was für eine Freiheit. Das ist so unfassbar. <lacht> und ähm, das Gleiche ist heute zum Beispiel, ähm, bei Spielen, wo du, Cyberpunk ist da zum Beispiel ganz praktisch, wenn du mit Charaktern redest, welche Freiheiten du dann hast. Oder ob du nur starre irgendwie diese eine Kamera hast, wo dann der Charakter immer so dich anguckt, so. Aber nie was passiert. Oder, oder ob das vielleicht alles wirklich ein bisschen inszeniert ist und du die Kamera bewegen kannst. Und ich, bei Cyberpunk halt sehr krass, du kannst einfach weggehen, das Gespräch abbrechen, äh, mittendrin voll geil gemacht, macht's noch immersiver. Also heute musst du da schon andere Sachen finden als, als eine Sequenz, sag ich mal. Ja, ich mach mal weiter. In any medium, in any thing, before experience something like this, where this immersive experience of this actually happening like this, and at that point it's like, okay, I see what it is we're doing. And um, it's, it's this kind of um, immersive, um, unbroken um, experience that happens to you, the player. And then that was this key principle about how, you know, um, we, we never take you out of that role. Personally, uh, uh, the difference between before the disaster sequence and after the disaster sequence, I felt we really had, I had an understanding that this product was going to be special or it's, it was going to be possible, it was going to be tied together. Whereas before that, there was a lot of really good stuff and a lot of little things all disconnected. Um, but we man well, you guys managed to tie two very different parts of the game together really well. And I thought, oh, okay, now I feel like we're on a track for finishing this product. To me, it, it shifted my brain to have a lot of confidence that this product's coming together rather than I'm just generating. Ich mag es nicht, wenn Leute ihre Spiele Product nennen. Kann jeder machen, wie er will, ja, im Grunde genommen. Aber ich mag es immer nicht, weil das hört sich dann. Na, weiß ich nicht. Das ist, ist, halt, ist halt ein Spiel, kein Produkt. Also, ich meine, das ist so. Content, that independent of ist aber subjektives von mir. One of the ways we were funding our development was we sold a preview copy of Half-Life 2. Um, es wirkt immer so, als wenn Leute disconnected von ihrem eigenen and so Produkt. They had in their contract that we had to deliver it to them by certain dates. Genau, klingt so, ja, ja liebt bloß sehen, genau, es klingt so, als würde jemand nicht sein Herzblut da reinkippen, really sondern irgendwas just, you know, nur zusammentackern für den Verkauf. Hey, there was a deliverable. We got it done. And you know, we shipped it off to them. And then I swear the next day it leaked. And I was just livid at first, which was stupid. But I was just like, oh, I can't believe you guys let this get out. Like, you know, this wasn't us, you know. And then it turned into something amazing where people started playing it. And it was all over. And we started, you know, seeing it you know, online, what people were thinking about it. And I forget which magazine who said, usually we don't review, you know, beta software. But they reviewed it and said, this is awesome. And that gave us a tremendous amount of confidence. You know, it was an outside um, validation of, of what we were trying to do, you know, that it was the right thing. I think just with first person shooters already kind of, they were kind of like the vowels of, of weapons you put into first person. You got to have a shotgun. Exactly. And it was obviously a pistol. Shotgun you know, so you need your, your weapon that's going to make you struggle and you, you, you drive you to get another weapon. That was a lesson in how to make all of your weapons as orthogonal as possible. So each one did something completely different. All, all of the crazy weapons, um, those are my fault. Uh, so I did like the rocket launcher and the gauss gun and yeah. uh, the snarks. <laughs> Oh, I like snarks. <laughs> snarks always made me laugh. It's just always funny to watch people run away from the snarks. The squeak grenade. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, called the great. snark, but yeah, yeah. I wanted something, a little creature that you could bring up and hold and you could throw it out and it would just start running. Because people were camping and everybody hated campers yeah. at that point. Yeah, so you wanted the anti-camp weapon. But it, it was kind of, you could literally find a little hidey hole and just sit out there and just throw out 30 yeah. of them. And they're all over the map. I had a cat and you, you'd sit blue. there and you'd do your Ooh. finger blue. Yeah, you'd do your finger towards him and he'd get mad at you and he'd swat. So that was the inspiration for that, that particular animation. <laughs> and then the other, that, that big uh, alien creature with the, um, 
we, we needed some kind of alien weapon. Drew that one, built that one, animated that one, but that was also another one that would, whenever you would, you could get in a corner and just shoot them in the air because the hornets would track. I think that was Fly the biggest guys. thrill is brainstorming these with your, your, your crew, making them, building them, putting them in the game, and then playing with them, and then they're fun. So there's, there's sort of a trope of having a melee weapon. Uh, I think it was Steve Bond and Ken Birdwell and I were saying, we wanted a device where the world was reacting to you. It was, really goes back to that theory of fun. But we were just running around like idiots, smacking the wall. <laughs> it's an odd thing to know in retrospect, but at the time it felt profoundly satisfying to be able to smack walls. Weißt du noch, bei, uh, bei Doom oder bei Duke? Wenn man einfach die ganze Zeit, oder bei Wolfenstein sogar, du bist die ganze Zeit gegen die Wände gelaufen, hast Leertaste gedrückt, weil du Geheimräume gesucht hast. Und dann bist du einfach stundenlang. Äh, 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 und dann immer, wenn das Geräusch kam, und dann ging auf einmal eine Tür auf und ja, ja, geil. Und dann im Geheimraum. Äh, 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 und manchmal waren Geheimräume in Geheimräumen. Das war, das war, oh, das war richtig geil. Das hat so viel Spaß gemacht, aber es war, es war so nervig, aber hat so viel Spaß gemacht. Und das war so rewarding, wenn du da was gefunden hast und dann irgendwas Geiles dahinter war. Voll gut. And that was just an example of how Blake that, Stone. Oh God, Aliens of Gold. Of oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. That's all lange her. Translating into a set of decisions Shoot. that were, were really visceral. When you're going around whacking a wall, a crowbar is an obvious thing to whack the wall with. Sound to let you know what's going to happen, that's really makes it powerful. So we're always on the lookout for that in level design and monster design, communicating because the AI is often hidden from the player. So we use the sound to broadcast the internal state of the AI. <laughs> You know, soldiers, they tell you... Diese geilen 22 Kilohertz Samples einfach. Oh, Traum. Cover. Einmal Traum. You know, they are broadcasting as constantly as they can what's about to happen. So it was really important to try to keep those states distinct so that as you play the game, you're actually, whether you're aware of it or not, you're starting to be able to tell what's about to happen. We, we knew he was a musician too, so he could do sounds, but you know, He also decided he was going to write the sound engine. And Klar. then he wrote the soundtrack. So. And he'd never written a soundtrack before, and he wrote the whole you know, soundtrack for the game and won an award, and <laughs> it was crazy. There just weren't that many of us. Uh, you know, I had a little bit of a background playing music. I, I understood the, the sound engine really well, so it was really easy for me to just hook sounds in, and I understood enough about the level design side that I could, I could kind of connect those things a little bit. Um, the sounds could come from anywhere, and then I just heavily modified them. Usually those are animal sounds, reversing, changing the, the pitch, chopping them up and rearranging them. Head crabs were rats. The little squeaky, yeah, that's a rat slowed way, way down and then reversed. Yeah, the DSP stuff was another cool thing that Kelly Build. When you got an event, it sounded like you were an event, uh, and that wasn't really happening, I guess, in at least in Quake and other games I was playing back then. You know, we had these huge silos, these cavernous spaces. The day they had their own echoey DSP, it made an enormous difference, right? You, you believed the space. Eigentlich würde der Raum das Geräusch gar nicht machen, aber es ist halt da. Oh God, Chuck Jones asked him if he could, if the characters could speak and have their mouths move. And <laughs> Kelly said, you know, that's super easy. You know, I could just look at the audio and, and see if they're talking and, and, and do that. But like getting their mouth to move is stupid, he says to me. And I look, Chuck Jones told me the same thing. I told him making the mouths move was super trivially easy, but knowing when they're talking and knowing how to follow the <laughs> envelope of the speech was, would be impossible. And Kelly and I just both looked at each other and like, oh. And so I went back to my office and he went back to his office. And I think within an hour, 
the characters were talking and their mouths were moving. And it was only because we sat there at lunch bitching about an animator <laughs> who was 100% right. Why are you leaving me here? Scientist conversations, uh, Kelly and I made that. When they're next to each other, one scientist will occasionally play a question and the other one will give him an answer. And it's not a s script, <laughs> you know? It just might be, it might not always make sense. I am rather looking forward to this analysis, aren't you? I don't think so. But it, it had a bunch of personality. It was really cool. And it worked on getting those guys to look at you and turn their heads. When we first added the ability for scientists to respond to the player and other things in the environment, what we, I would call them what response rules. The first time that went in, the, they came flying down the, the elevator. And one of them looks at you and goes, oh, hello, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> and then they explode into a pile of jibs at the bottom. Hello. The automatic diagnostic and announcement system welcomes you to the Black Mesa Research Facility. So Have a secure day. Okay, das haben wir gerade gesehen, ne? Das, uh, die Info, die gerade kommt, ja, wahrscheinlich. Wir really started working on the biggest part of the game, which I ended up shipping, which was surface tension. Prior to then, a lot of the work that I had done was the alien research labs, which turned into questionable ethics, um, and all of all of that was ditched. There were some concepts made it through, but everything was rebuilt from zero. But you know what did make it through was power up. Yeah, basically that geometry survived completely intact. It was so closely designed for that creature that because the creature survived, that the levels survived along with it. Yeah, there's this sort of central... Manchmal wünsche ich mir, ähm, also bei Filmen ist das oft so, die Filme kommen raus ne? und dann wird die, werden die, die kommen im Kino, dann werden die verkauft auf Blu-ray, Pipapo und dann kommt irgendwann ein Jahr oder zwei Jahre später kommt noch ein Director's Cut äh, und der kommt dann direkt auf Blu-ray, muss halt nochmal kaufen, bla bla bla. Bei Spielen wäre das, glaube ich, nicht so beliebt. Ja? Also ich glaube, Spieler sind da, glaube ich, anders als äh, Filmkäufer. Aber ich würde mir manchmal wünschen, weil man das einfach, weil man so oft weiß bei Spielen, dass vor Release noch konnte, sehr viel Content rausgeschnitten wird, den man einfach nicht mehr schafft und so weiter, pipapo. Ähm, ich würde mir wünschen, dass irgendwie ein Jahr später oder zwei noch einfach mal ähm, irgendwie ein Update kommt, äh, ein kostenloses Update am liebsten natürlich, ähm, wo dann die geschnittenen Sachen weil man dann hinterher noch hinten raus noch ein bisschen mehr Zeit hatte, natürlich in den Bugfixungen und so, dass man, dass man das vielleicht noch mal als DLC rausballert, was, was rausgeschnitten wollte, äh, wurde, was man, äh, was man aber ursprünglich eigentlich im Game haben sollte oder wollte. Das würde ich mir wünschen. So eine Art Director's Cut, aber halt für Games. Und da ist halt die Frage, macht man das dann kostenlos oder, ne, weil Spieler, ihr wisst, ne, wie gesagt, bei, bei Blu-Rays, da, da kaufen Leute noch mal den Director's Cut, um alle Cuts zu haben, keine Ahnung. Ähm, bei Spielen ist das oft anders. Circular thing where you have to rotate the train and you have to kill the gargantua first. Release the game cut. Defending the way out. Nee, würde ich mir manchmal wünschen. To, you have to go to a, like a, another Gerade area which looks very much like it's rein. designed for Quake. Genau, Death Stranding hat ein Director's Cut. It was. <laughs> ich weiß aber nicht, was da drin ist, ehrlich gesagt. Also ob da Sachen sind, die vorher rausgeschnitten wurden. The generator and then you can switch the power on and then you can take the train out. Yeah, I remember him being totally central to this whole thing. And then, well, how do we block the player, which is, I mean, that's pretty much like design point number one for all level design. Okay, well, how do we pre prevent the player from just walking straight out through the exit? And you design backwards from there. In the first year, we built a lot of world space, a lot of track, as we call it. And the programmers would try to fit the AI into the existing maps. What we did the second year was we built the AI in very constrained environments that showcased the AI. Let's make the ideal space for the AI and then give that to the level designers to incorporate those elements into their map so that the, it worked better and was more interesting. And that Gargantua was an example of that. And the grunts especially. Yeah, we had the, the AI that Steve had been working on. And ich hätte so gerne die Alpha-Version, ne? Ich, äh, ich finde, okay, jetzt fange fang ich wieder an. Ich finde Data Hoarding extrem spannend, äh, wo man aber auch bei Spielen zum Beispiel äh, immer so verschiedene Versionen einfach sammelt. Ähm, das heißt, dass du, dass du von Spielen, auch spannend bei Early Access, bla bla bla, mit Updates, bla bla, teilweise ganz andere Spiele, aber du hast halt quasi alle noch irgendwie verfügbar. 
Das würde ich mir bei Steam manchmal wünschen, dass man mit der Version zurückspringen kann, wie bei Minecraft zum Beispiel. Du kannst eine Version aussuchen und spielst dann die. Fände ich unglaublich spannend. Fände ich super spannend bei allen möglichen Spielen. Und gerade bei Half-Life, wo ich gerade gesehen habe, einfach Version 0.5.2 spielen, ähm, nur weil es geht. Ähm, kann man bei Half-Life? Oh, das wusste ich gar nicht. Ah. Ich kann also bei den, bei den Steam Games, die ich spiele, da gibt es immer Zwangsupdates. Das äh, früher konnte ich sagen, okay, ich will keine Updates haben, ich konnte die alte Version spielen. Ähm, ganz, ganz früher habe ich mir äh, Versionen immer archiviert, ja, um die spielen zu können. Ähm, aber kann man bei Steam an manchen Games. Wahrscheinlich genau die Games, die ich nicht spiele, wa? <lacht> Scheiße. Okay, okay. Seven Days kann man das auch, deswegen konnte ich eure Base spielen. Stimmt, bei Seven Days. Ja, stimmt, bei Seven Days konntest du ja äh, über Eigenschaften, ne? Stimmt ja, stimmt ja, stimmt ja. Muss der, der Entwickler muss das Feature unterstützen. Ja, das würde ich mir gerne, das würde ich mir gerne für alle, für alle Spiele automatisch wünschen. Genau, aber bei Mist, bei Mist Survival, die alte Version spielen wir mit, mit der Map. Ich glaube, da gab es auch einen auch Dropdown. Ja, ja, ja. Ah, okay. Satisfactory geht das, wenn man sich das selber speichert. Ja, gut, da musst du halt jedes Spiel in jeder Version irgendwie vorliegen haben. Geht irgendwann auf dem Plattenplatz. Ja, aber eigentlich wäre es geil, wenn man auch, auch im Sinne von ähm, Datenarchivierung, dass man jede Version quasi noch archiviert und so. Finde ich, ich weiß nicht warum, ich finde das irgendwie interessant. Naja, so, kommen wir machen weiter. He had designed all these interesting encounters with them just in his test map and so Bei Minecraft finde ich auch mal spannend alte Version und so. Und so die alte Alpha Version. Oh. Okay, let's let's start. Ach, the player comes in low. Die macht nicht mehr so viel Spaß, a, aber hey. Marine on the same Memories. level and the next one they're up high and then they come running down because it was really neat to see them retreat, they try to run back up the stairs and try to flank you from another side. No Man's Sky wäre auch spannend. Steve Bond, ja, like I mentioned earlier, was this really young guy who had been making mods in Quake C, really the designer for so much of the AI. I mean, all the stuff that's good about the, the soldiers, the, the grunts you fight in, in Half-Life. Yeah, we had a little bit of a language front is we front. sort of use to gut. say, you know, this. this is a place they can climb. This is a place they can jump to. This is a good place to hide. These are good places to go in general or interesting places. So, you know, the AI had a little bit of help. Oh, wie laut. We're trying to build something that utilized, you know, the train technology that Jay was working on. And we thought, well, let's give the player something that they can control, but in a limited way. We couldn't do vehicles like you see in Half-Life 2. So we did this, the con most constrained vehicle we could think of, which was the train. Players didn't always bring the train with them. And so you had a bunch of these poor people walking down these tunnels. Was oh, that why you electrified the, the and rail? Yet, and the rails, were, uh, that was part of the feedback. From that. <laughs> part of the feedback was, well, you can just bypass all that. So we made the, the rails electric. It's like, well, maybe that'll teach them to use, bring the train with them. But the basic idea was, you know, let's explore that and then also reveal some of the hidden deep parts of the base, you know, the abandoned areas where you might get a lot more of the Zen creatures. You know, we had designed some of the, some of the ones that didn't make it into the game to appear there, you know, bats that would dive bomb you and while Stuka you're on the bats. train, yeah, Stuka bats, and then um, we also tried hard to not make it feel like it was the super linear thing, so we tried to give little branches, and so there were some challenges there. Die Fels sind irgendwie aus wie Fleischbrocken. Well, there is a, there's a really good sketch that Kelly Bailey made, which basically charted surface tension. And it was pretty extensive. Like it went through the cliffside and it went through um, areas where tanks were and like a lot of soldier holdouts. Yeah, it even went through the desert with the cactuses and uh, the helicopters and then across a dam. It was pretty extensive. Yeah, when I saw that sketch, I was so motivated yes. to just start building all of that stuff. So I ran ahead with a lot of level design and a lot of geometry and it seems like a lot of it stuck in some way or another, which is really amazing. I did the, oh yeah, the dam, which was funny. I just did that in a day. Right. Like it was like about four <laughs> or five hours. I did a Hoover Dam thing because I like the Hoover Dam. I saw a concept of the cliffside. I think Harry Teasley built that render of the skybox. Yes. Uh, and I just thought, holy crap, this is perfect for Vertigo. Like whatever we do here, We have to play on vertigo and uh, narrow little edges uh, and you know, places you would like to normally dodge a grenade but you can't. Uh. And that's the that's the moment. That's really the big part of that level is that reveal. The play is kind of 
kind of supports it afterward. Yeah. The helicopter comes in, you're fighting the helicopter, which is awesome. Das war sick, einfach. First of all, I had, a, I had a bunch of textures, and then every time I made, made new ones, whoever was working on the new levels would be like, oh, fresh textures, I'm going to use those. Somebody making another level would start using them, and I was like, no, this is chaos. We, <laughs> we, we need to restrict this. So I started naming the texture sets by the level that they were made for. I was trying to enforce some sort of like visual cohesion, and, and so that, that really ended up working. There was one level I did, it was the introduction of the sort of the bounce pads, uh, the alien bounce pads in the, in the real world. And because, you know, story-wise, like, okay, you're getting closer to hitting the alien world. So I was, well, let's get a little bit of alien world infection into the real world. So I had done it just as a visual thing. John Guthrie made it 10 times better. And that's actually where he found the photo of my daughter, because I didn't put my daughter in Gordon's locker. I hid her in like this destroyed office someplace, you know, <laughs> as a little Easter egg for myself. And, they, and John went and put my daughter's <laughs> photo in Gordon's locker, which I think was a good decision. Schön. Aber die Grafik genommen, weil ist ja ein Bild. Find ich, oh, ich find's gut. Ich find's irgendwie gut. I still get questions about die Tochter ist einfach an einem Stück Game-Geschichte. From people who've now thought about this for 25 years, and they're thinking that there's 25 years worth of development went into this. I'm like, on some level, I, when you start talking about lore, I'm like, well, there's Black Mesa. That was just a matter. We needed a name for something that was evocative. In that entrance, when you get off the train, and there's that lobby where there's a big map on it. And when we were making that map, that was fairly early on, I put a dot in New Mexico. And then that turned into, I think Mark saw that, and he was like, oh, where is that? This is where we are. And then he named it Black Mesa. That is a favorite thing of mine, actually. If you come up with a name for something, then, and it evokes something, then you don't have to whole, write the whole story. It's because it's a conspiracy plot. Everybody knows more about it than you do. So you don't have to do, you don't have to answer those questions. You should. You just keep raising questions and make the mystery kind of thing. Like dialogue came in later. Also a lot of the scripted sequences came in later. And those helped to kind of sharpen the storytelling aspect of it because, I mean, setting expectations to get up to the surface and then like, oh no, they're not here to help us. The whole thing about diegetic writing, right? Like keeping the exposition in the game instead of outside the game. You know, I give a lot of credit to Mark. Um, after play tests, um, we'd realized that maybe you need more of a dialogue cue about something. That's when we started to have, do like scientists who were literally. Ich finde es einfach wild, dass, die, dass, dass da nicht von Anfang an so ein krasser Plan dahinter war, sondern dass sie einfach jeder hat irgendwas gemacht, worauf der Bock hatte. Dann haben die alles Mögliche, alles Mögliche rumgebastelt, bla bla bla. Dann stellen die fest, oh fuck, nur noch drei Monate, wir müssen das irgendwie zusammenkleben zu irgendeinem Spiel. Äh, wir müssen irgendwie ähm, gucken, wie wir das machen. Ähm, und dann kommen am Ende noch irgendwelche Dialoge rein zur Story. Das ist, das ist so wild. Das ist einfach so komplett wild und am Ende kommt dieses Stück raus, was einfach so wirkt, als wäre das von vorne bis hinten durchgeplant gewesen und mit dem roten Faden und erzählt eine epische Geschichte und bla. Das uff, so ähnlich muss ich den Wald wohl heute noch. Das ist unverständlich. Ich wünschte, ich wünschte, das würde bei Bethesda so gut funktionieren. Mit den Stories und so, dass man die ne, am Ende so und dann bla. Das, uh, wow pop up in a corner and go, go that way. There's there's a few of those that we stuck in right at the end when we'd like, well, we get one more session with Hal. He can say, go down here, you know, get go around that corner. Well, so much for the government. Their idea of containment is to kill everyone associated to the project. Judging from your hazard suit, I'd say you were part of what went wrong. I knew Hal from San Francisco as a an artist, cartoonist. He was also an animator and an actor in some science fiction movies. So when we got down to the wire, we did a bunch of voice casting and nothing was right. And I just kept thinking of Hal. And I finally just called him and said, Hal, I want, I want you to at least talk to people here so they can hear your voice. And I got him on a speakerphone and I had a bunch of people gathered in my office. And I'm like, okay, Hal, everybody's here. And he's like, well, what would you like me to say? And everybody was like, this is him, <laughs> this is the guy. Why do we all have to wear these ridiculous ties? Another interesting voice thing was um, the G-Man. So we liked Mike Shapiro's work. So we, we knew we wanted to use him, but we brought him in to do 
Barney and also the G-Man. So we did a take on all the G-Man lines with kind of a straight voice and it was thinking that, okay, we have something safe, but we're not super excited about it. And give us something else. And he does, does this crazy lizard voice. The border world then is in our control for the time being, thanks to you. Quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. And we took it back and everybody just loved the crazy lizard voice. And so Und jetzt die deutsche Stimme. So that's, that's how it worked out. Did you do the Nihilanth? I did. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nihilanth. Just imagine his head floating in space as a baby. I went into Gabe's office and I demanded Gabe to either fire Ken or I quit. <laughs> what? What? And Gabe just laughed. <laughs> what? Correct response from Gabe. Yeah. I was like, oh. Until Bill got there, I was the oldest guy there. It was hard uh, because, you know, I had to go home in the evenings, whereas the kids who had just, the young guys who just moved out from Florida or wherever, they did not have to go home in the evenings. I'd go home, see my kids when they were in bed. I would come back down the hill to Valve. Nobody else I worked with had to get up to get their kids off to school in the morning, but I did. You're wired to just take full advantage of the situation. Like you're like, you put everything into it. So when we say we worked 18 hour days, that's no exaggeration. Yeah. Not, not at all. I can edit all day. I can make, I can design all day. I don't have to worry about anything. You know, two guys from Microsoft <laughs> start a game studio with, with a bunch of incredibly capable, you know, with an incredible team. You're gonna, you're gonna push yourself harder than ever before. I don't usually crunch real hard. I, I, get, I get it done in, uh, like, I come in, I work, I go home, and a lot of people were living, like, you know, really long hours. You know, the, the classic, we'll all come in at one and then goof around for a while and then work late into the morning, you know, late at night. I was employee 17. Um, it, there was a, a woman that was the kind of the office manager, and eventually um, Mona Lisa Guthrie, Guthrie came in. As the at the desk, I was the only woman on the team. <sighs> I was uh -oh. not awesome. Uh -oh. I decided to become a baseball uh -oh. fan here after the birth of my first daughter, because so she's the one in Gordon's locker, Isabel, but she was um, she's very special needs. She um, she's 25 today. Uh, you know, cognitively she's about three years old, so. Um, so after her birth, in the middle of Half-Life production, it was, it was really hard. It was really hard because uh, we were getting about two hours of sleep at a stretch because she had to be fed through a tube in her stomach every two hours. I had a, just a difficult time relating to the world when she was a baby. I had a hard time just talking to people because I was just kind of tired and angry all the time. Yeah, my wife, she worked at Valve for a while. Uh, she did a bunch of textures for the game. Like I said, she did those soda machines. She did, she did just a bunch of level textures. She textured um, a Big Mama, the uh, sort of boss creature she textured him. But um, when Isabel arrived, she obviously had a lot of issues. So um, yeah, it's had to stop working and, uh, and stay with her at home. And it was the last year of Half-Life, and we pretty much crunched that whole year. So uh, I was at work a lot. It was, it was hard. It, it, was, it was definitely a hard year. Hmm. Games have often had this thing where they're just a little too attached to Star Wars, Blade Runner, Aliens. So it wasn't that hard to try to get people to go, let's think of something mm. really alien. Like what Zen was initially was you're gonna go inside a huge alien das organism and kill it or figure out how to turn it on or off or something like that. I didn't know you, we couldn't actually do Aber that or what was involved. What does it mean to have alien architecture or a planet that's biologically defining the structures in it as opposed to what the tools were good at, which is making rectangles. And then slowly it scaled back till it was more and more 
corridors, and that everybody was really good at. People were finishing up stuff and I was still working on Zen <clears throat> because it was like it went through a lot of iteration or at least uh, we're trying to figure out what it was. Pe different people were taking swings at it, either in static well, concepts. Were you under a bit of a timeline crunch for it as well? Yeah, it was the end of the game. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to cut stuff out and they're like, no, no, leave it in. I'm right. like, yeah, but I don't have any, I don't, there's nothing, I don't have any support for this. Right. And then, and then after a lot of it was built, it's like, oh yeah, we're going to change the gravity and give you a jump pack. That came later. <laughs> and I was like, ah. There's a lot of stuff, especially in Zen, where you know, you're getting close to a first draft of some things, right? Because we just didn't have time and we got to the, the end of the game. And so we, we considered not going to Zen, but uh, the art concepts people did were so cool. For the Zen textures, I uh, was deeply inspired by electron microscope imagery. And, and we had had so much of that regular structural das ist krass, wo die Frau ihre ganzen Ideen einfach hernimmt, ne? Aus der ganzen Welt. Mikrobiologie bis hin zu fette Schiffscontainer und allem Möglichen oder, 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 oder irgendwelche, irgendwelche, irgendwelche Länder, Landstriche. Das, holy shit, und es passt trotzdem alles so gut zusammen. Texture material that I wanted Wild to do something einfach. more organic. Insects as well. I think there's a lot of textures that were based on beetles. That was, that was really fun. And incredibly challenging levels to make because the that editor was not friendly for organic shapes. I built the little behaviors for the the tree that hits you if you get too close, and the the one the light stalk that kind of hides. But Ken did a bunch of AIs there. Uh, that that the the floating controller guys. And the flying guys were great, but you had to set up air nodes for them to travel properly. I prototyped a lot, and some of those prototypes were used in the the final battle, I believe, and also for the Gonard, which I think Randy did. We, at some point, have to stop polishing. At some point, we have to, like, it is what it is. Um, and if the player hasn't had fun up until that point, well, then we failed. They, they're not going to get to that point, so who cares? Uh, it just has to finish, and it did. Yeah, um, and there's always Half-Life 2 to win them back. <laughs> I love that sensation of being alone in an alien dimension. But the experience that people really liked in the game was Scientists pop up and Barney pops up and you have companions and you have this feeling of companionship around you with all the other stuff that's going on. So a lot of people miss that, which I understood and I think if we had thought about the ending from the beginning, we would have figured out some ways to do that a little more. I remember. So sahen Fotos früher aus, Kinder. <lacht> die waren gar nicht auf dem Handy. Du musstest äh, Filmrollen in den Laden abgeben und zwei Wochen später konntest du deine entwickelten Fotos abholen oder die von fremden Leuten. Ist egal, weil die waren alle sowieso in einer Box und da stand auch einfach Name und Adresse und alles drauf. Und du konntest aber gucken, wem welche Fotos gehören. Konntest du durchgucken, wenn du wolltest. Äh, ja, und dann musstest du deine raussuchen. Und, äh, ja, das äh, wilde Zeiten. Ich habe auch noch solche Fotos. Uh, coming back from downtown Cabo, Ooh. very drunk, and then <laughs> running to the beach, but didn't know there was like a six foot retaining wall there, so I just went right over. And then I was hurting so much, I slept the night where I fell. Yeah, I woke up the next morning. I had never like heard a, that a really story. Stiff neck. Oh my God. It's a yeah. good thing you were pretty young. I remember so after sehen echte Menschen aus, nicht wie auf Instagram. On the, on the game. Uh, I'm at home <laughs> one morning, you know, uh, taking a shower, and my wife asked me, you know, like, it's done. Is it any good? Is the game any fun? The box I, have I auch. I don't know. <laughs> like, I hope so. Es gab, uh, von Half-Life gibt es eine gibt's ne normal große Box und es gibt noch so eine so ne Big Box. Da gab es auch von Might Magic und so gab es auch noch ein paar. Uh, Habe ich beide. Bin ich, sehr, bin ich sehr happy. I, I don't think it's exaggerating by saying if any one of the crew had disappeared for a month, we wouldn't have shipped. You know, the, the, didn't matter who they were, you know, everybody was, a, was mission critical. My inspiration from Valve, what I really took away with me was that the thing that is most important to me is what are we making? Coming in as a texture artist, you don't have a lot of expectation that you're going to get to influence that. And I was able to have quite a bit of influence in on, on the sehr. what. It was so fun to work with the people who were making Half-Life. The collection of people were diverse, at least like in their professional back. Kann man die Bilder auch reinzoomen mit zwei Fingern? Äh, das geht auch. Dazu musst du die Brille abnehmen und so machen. Dann, dann kannst du die Bilder auch rein, dann siehst du die deutlicher, dass das geht. Ja. Grounds was kind of all over the place. 
And so figuring out how to work with all those people, but also just the fact that we had hired really stellar people who were good at collaborating, like they're conscientious people, deeply passionate about what they wanted to create. That just was a recipe for a professionally like really good time. It seems to me that one of the things that good games do is make two games worth of stuff and then throw away the bad game. And fortunately, like Valve was able to do that. A lot of companies could. It's a bit, it's a bit schade, um, dass in der, also ich glaube, ich glaub, uh, Indie Games haben das teilweise noch, aber bei, bei vielen Sachen ist so ein bisschen diese Aufbruchstimmung, ne? wenn, wenn irgendwann so industrialisiert wird und so weiter, ist diese Aufbruchstimmung so ein bisschen weg. Damals waren das so die Anfänge, die man so miterlebt hat und dann waren irgendwie so die ganzen jungen, ambitionierten Nerds und Freaks und was weiß ich was, ähm, wie man hier gesehen hat irgendwie und ähm, wo dann zehn Leute einfach reichen, um dieses Game zu stemmen oder 20 vielleicht, die alle, alle bescheuert sind, nachts da rumhängen, sich die Energy Drinks reinkloppen ähm, und dann kommt am Ende irgendwas Geiles dabei raus. Ähm, Heute gibt es das teilweise noch bei Indie-Studios, aber heute hat sich das Ganze, glaube ich, alles so ein bisschen, genau die Pionierzeit, genau die Pionierzeit, genau, genau. Und das ist immer schade, wenn sich sowas so ein bisschen, ich sag mal, durchindustrialisiert. Wenn, wenn, ne, das ist so ein bisschen, da geht genau dieser Pioniergeist so ein bisschen verloren. Und das finde ich, find ich eigentlich schade. That, bei, bei vielen Dingen. Aber einige Indie-Companies like, machen das ja zum Glück noch. Um, you know, Valve could afford to do that. I always have absolutely nothing interesting to say when people say, would you reflect on your legacy? Like, I really don't look back a whole lot. I'm always, I'm always excited by the future, Richtig right? So, so to on. me, it's like, I can look back at the things that we did, but to me, they're just sort of like the stepping to stones to, to what we're going to be able to do in the future. <laughs> I'm <the> frei. <laughs> I'm the that's just how I'm, that's just how I'm wired, right? Unreal. Unreal Tournament. Kein Portal drin. <lacht> cool. Voll, äh, voll geil. Voll geile Doku. Vielen Dank, dass ihr mich gezwungen habt, die anzugucken. Äh, sehr, sehr geil. Ich liebe solche Dokus. Es gibt noch einen anderen Channel, der heißt No Clip. Da gibt es auch noch eine Menge Gaming-Dokus. Kann ich auch sehr empfehlen. Ähm, ich schaue mir sowas wahnsinnig gerne an. Meistens lasse ich nebenbei mitlaufen, während ich was anderes mache. Ja, aber heute haben wir einfach mal drauf reagiert. Ich würde wahnsinnig gerne in ein Paralleluniversum gucken und sehen, was Valve heute machen würde, hätten sie Steam nicht erfunden. Das würde mich aber interessieren. Ich bin einfach, da wäre ich einfach neugierig. 100 Pro würde es Half-Life 3 geben. Ich bin ziemlich sicher, Half-Life 3 wäre ein Ding. Ich bin, ich bin fast sicher. Aber sie haben nicht nötig, irgendwas zu tun, worauf sie keinen Bock haben oder wo sie denken, wir können dem nicht gerecht werden. Sie haben es aber nicht nötig. Und ähm, das ist auch eine sehr geile Position, in der man sein kann. Also schon ziemlich geil. Geil. Und äh, Gabe, muss ich zugeben, bin vielleicht ein kleines, kleiner Fan, so klein finde find seine Äußerung gut, finde viele seiner Takes gut, äh, die er sonst so bringt, auch was Steam angeht und sowas. Ähm, finde ich oft, finde ich oft sehr, sehr gut. Also, ich schicke euch einen Link raus, lasst ein Like da, vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen auf YouTube, ne? Kuss geht raus und äh, im Stream geht's gleich weiter. Ciao!